that's a good start, but I promise I will be more steady as the evening wears on. Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Pat Cox. I will be moderating this afternoon's opening session, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here again to Leipzig, to welcome you to the International Transport Forum 2013, and to our forum whose theme is uh, funding and uh, transport. Uh, let me begin with some housekeeping. I understand that for interpretation, you will find Japanese on channel two, German on channel three, Russian on channel four, English on channel five, and French on channel six. Our opening session will begin with some introductory speeches and words of welcome from the presidency, uh, the Norwegian presidency of the Transport Forum this year, followed by an introductory remark and welcome by our German hosts, uh, and then uh, by the organizers of the forum, the International Transport Forum Secretariat in the person of the Secretary General. We will have a keynote speech uh, this year from Professor Sen from uh, Harvard University, but I shall introduce him uh, presently. Uh, we will then have uh, a speech by John Micklethwaite, the editor-in-chief of The Economist, uh, and we follow that with a panel discussion. So I think it promises to be a, a very interesting uh, and substantial afternoon. But it is now my great pleasure to invite the Norwegian presidency of ITF this year in the person of the Norwegian Minister for Transport and Communications, Marit Arnstad, please to open our conference. Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, um, it gives me great pleasure to be able to open uh, this uh, forum. Norway is very honored by, to act as the presidency on this summit of International Transport Forum and, to year's discussions, and this year's discussions on funding transport as the team. As Minister of Transport and Communication in Norway, I really look forward to follow the discussions and to look into the exhibition that take place here in Leipzig on the funding issues, but also on other important transport issues. Funding of transport is a major challenge for the transport policies. The demand for mobility through high quality transport networks and services are growing fast. With both public budget and private sector resources under constraint, governmental authorities and industry must together seek new ways of ensuring long stable uh, long-term funding for the sector. Transport is a cornerstone in the general policy for better welfare, creating jobs, for regional development and for meeting the environmental challenges of the future. A reliable, a re reliable intermodal integrated transport system is essential to economic prosperity and equitability access to goods and services. The system needs both to be financially sustainable, it needs to be safe, and it needs to meet high standards of environmental prote protection. Long-term planning and funding of transport infrastructure and operation required, requires consistent political and policies based on coherent objectives for the transport system. Sustainable transport funding draws from a range of resources, including general tax revenues, user charges, and private resources. As road fuel economy improves, fuel taxes re revenues will decline. This trend will accelerate in countries where climate change policies are stimulated, uh, like in my own countries, Norway. Therefore, private investment and project financed, financing in variety of forms 
including corporate investments and public-private partnerships, can make a ma major contribution to overall transport sector investments. The structure of financial systems or uh, financial efforts will differ from country to country. In Norway, user charges, charges linked to toll roads play an important role in financing new roads all over the country. I would personally like to thank you all for attending the 2013 International Transport Summit. It is my sincere wish that this summit proves to be of benefit to all of us taking part in it and, and that it gives us the opportunity to listen to a broad aspect of speeches and panel discussions on different issues related to transport. I would like to make a special thank to the Secretariat and its Secretary General, Mr. Jose Viegas, for all the preparations for this summit and to the German and the Federal Minister of Transport, Dr. Peter Ramsauer, for hosting this beautiful, this event in this beautiful city of Leipzig, which we, of course, get too little time to look around in. I would like to welcome you all to the participation of this International Transport Forum 2013, and I hope it will be a success for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister Einstein, for those words of uh, welcome. We have today with us more than 900 delegates from 76 states, with ministers from more than 60 states, joined by many NGOs and CEOs. And every year, this year being no exception, our German colleagues are and have been wonderful hosts. And it's my pleasure now to invite the Federal Minister of Transport and Urban Development since 2009, Dr. Peter Ramsauer, to address you. Ms. President, colleague Marit Anstatt, colleagues, Der ganzen Welt. I waited colleagues it, but I was uh, from the world in over. <laughs> it's kind of fast. But we have great interpreters and uh, you can listen to them. Okay. Once again. Liebe Kollegin Marit Anstatt, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen Marit Anstatt, aus der ganzen Welt, colleagues liebe from the world Jose, over. Viegas, uh, Jose Viegas, Pat Cox, uh, Pat Cox Wolfgang Tiefensee, Wolfgang, uh, Tiefensee as my predecessor Stadt, in this uh, position, uh, he, was, he uh, comes ETF from Leipzig, Leipzig and uh, he was the one who brought Meine ITF to Leipzig, in fact, Damen und Herren, ladies and, and gentlemen, Gäste, friends, guests, das Weltverkehrsforum ist in the diesem Jahr ITF, the zum International Transport Mal Forum, Gast is being in held in Leipzig Stadt. for the sixth ich time. Freue mich sehr, and I'm Sie very happy Eröffnung to welcome you to Leipzig the opening ceremony. Welcome to Leipzig. Insbesondere darf ich Ihnen die Grüße I can also say Angela hello Merkel on behalf of Mitteln our Federal Sie Chancellor, Ms. Angela Merkel. Uh, she wishes us an interesting in time, uh, interesting Meine days Damen und Herren, in Leipzig, in fact. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, discussions can only be fruitful, discussions can only bear fruit Politik, when all relevant players Wirtschaft uh, policy makers, and politicians, uh, from the the people from the science field, Ideen people from all walks of life, uh, people from every part of society, they all have to be able to make a contribution. So I'm very happy that we have renowned representatives from all those fields of life. 
And, uh, neben den Teilnehmern, neben Ihnen, sind es vor allen Dingen aber auch die Organisatoren, die zum Erfolg einer Veranstaltung uh, who make a contribution to Mein a ganz besonderer event. Dank gilt deshalb I would Ihnen, liebe thank you, Kollegin uh, Anstatt, für die Übernahme and, uh, der Präsidentschaft. Anstatt. Before having Zusammen taken on the presidency mit dem ITF, ITF. und Together vielen, with the vielen ITF Mitarbeiterinnen und Mitarbeitern uh, the haben Sie ein wirklich staff, hochkarätig uh, besetztes und thematisch top breit gefächertes Weltverkehrsforum a top, uh, zum ITF diesjährigen Hauptthema vorbereitet, Funding a of Transport. And, uh, mit diesem Hauptthema hat sich das Weltverkehrsforum in diesem Jahr eines der weltweit wirklich wichtigsten Themen im Bereich der Infrastruktur infrastructure. Die Aufgabe ist von enormer Bedeutung, denn Wachstum und Beschäftigung sind nur möglich mit einer leistungsfähigen Verkehrsinfrastruktur an efficient transport infrastructure as well as a high level of mobility. Die Modernisierung und auch der Modernisierung und Neubau uh, and unserer Infrastruktur of ist eine infrastructure Daueraufgabe is und erfordert die Sicherstellung erheblicher a, Investitionsmittel. Uh, Dies wird we need aus verschiedenen Gründen zunehmend schwieriger. Zum einen more sind more die difficult. staatlichen on the one Haushalte hand, begrenzt. Uh, und zum anderen Public steigen budgets, die technischen und budgets natürlich auch tight die, Te die and, uh, uh, ökologischen there are, Anforderungen. Of course, environmental Mit der klassischen Haushaltspolitik, meine Damen und Herren, uh, werden wir demands, den bestehenden Investitionsstau in and unseren Ländern kaum dauerhaft bewältigen In den Vordergrund bottleneck. rücken was we have to concentrate mehr on for that reason is neue alternatives and new sources mein land of funds. Hier, ich glaube, Germany, an neuem my country, uh, has wir new things on offer in this respect. Stückweisen Umstellung For instance, von Haushaltsfinanzierung have, uh, zu Nutzerfinanzierung, uh, einen financing wichtigen to user financing. Schritt, einen wichtigen And, uh, ersten Schritt zu mehr Unabhängigkeit vom Haushalt getan. From Ein our budget. vergleichsweise junges Thema im Bereich A der Verkehrsinfrastrukturfinanzierung sind in die öffentliche traffic infrastructure financing is neben public private partnerships PPP bieten aber auch weitere modelle die chance there are zur other models zur mobilisierung which are vital and uh, which could mobilize in leipzig and involve steht also and integrate die frage private im capital. mittelpunkt so wie wir in leipzig we are going to focus on the issue verlässliche how in the Finanzierungsperspektiven long term we can create reliable financing and funding prospects for Meine Damen und Herren, liebe Gäste, lassen Sie uns deshalb die vor uns liegenden drei Tage intensiv nutzen, denn unsere Verkehrswege sind weit aus mehr als nur Asphalt und Beton. Nein, sie sind die entscheidenden Uh, they are the crucial lifelines in society, and uh, they are the very backbone of our economies. And it is in this spirit I would like to say welcome to all of you again. Thank you, Minister. Our next speaker has already been uh, referred to. And that is the Secretary General of ITF, Mr. Jose Diegas, who with his colleagues has undertaken the organization task for today, and I now give him the floor. Minister Anstatt, Minister Ramsauer, dear ministers, distinguished guests, I hope you will enjoy 
the next few days here in Leipzig at the International Transport Forum Annual Summit. I trust you will find a lot of hard work as again improved and augmented an event that within five years has established itself as the Global Summit of Transport Ministers. The ITF Summit is gathering ministers and high-level representatives from more than 60 countries, CEOs from many high-level corporations, public officials, academics, and NGOs. This is the summit of the Transport Forum, the place to be, the place to learn, the place to meet, and the place to do business. We have over 1,000 participants and the highest ever share of private participants. We have so many um, also side events and exhibition stands. So I am delighted to have all you here and give you a warm, warm welcome. Herzlich willkommen. The topic of this year is of greatest relevance to us all, funding transport. This is not only about new investment, this is also about maintenance and operations. And it's about expansion, but also upgrade and modernization. We face apparently a big dilemma, because on the one hand, demand for mobility is rising rapidly, particularly in the developing economies, and new challenges must be addressed, both on green transport and introduction of intelligent transport systems. On the other hand, public budgets are tight and will remain so for the foreseeable future in the majority of countries. Meanwhile, infrastructure maintenance is essential and is sometimes seriously neglected in many countries with consequences on safety, quality of service, and I would say in future increase of costs. The irony is that there is a lot of liquidity in the markets. So the difficulty is not lack of money, but the need to tailor the transport projects in a way that it is interesting for those investors. Many innovative approaches are already being tested around the globe, and now we need to share and to compare experiences, to build on what we have learned, and to let ourselves be inspired by what is done elsewhere. We have a great program. Many high-caliber speakers, including our keynote, Professor Sen, who will be speaking shortly. I am very interested in hearing what he has to say, and I'm sure all of you have, so I'll keep short my speech. We have many distinguished representatives of main stakeholders in transport, and we have a range of session formats. Keynotes, other presentations, roundtables, panels, workshops. Our open ministerial session tomorrow, where ministers and CEOs will debate the theme of funding transport, is a format which was successfully introduced last year, and we look very much forward to that this year. This is not a paperless summit, but a summit with a lot less paper than in previous years. We have cut the total volume of printing by about half. We have all the documentation available online and will be available online. We have a record number of side events organized by partner organizations that use the summit to show and to discuss the topics of their main interest because they know that you are here. We also have a record number of exhibitors, around 50 this year, showing innovation in policy, in concepts, and in products. And we have live demonstrations. I want to thank our sponsors, Toll Collect, Turkish Airlines, iMobility Challenge from the FIA, Bombardier and DECRA. We very much appreciate their engagement in the summit. I want to highlight that this year is the 60th anniversary of the foundation of the organization that is the mother of ITF, that is the European Conference of Ministers of Transport, that was funded in 1953. We have decided to digitize all the documents of ECMT and make them available online. This is now available online. All the documents, technical documents, the uh, policy documents of the ECMT since 1953 have just finished being digitized and are now available. Some of them have only historical interest, but some of them are very relevant still today, particularly for the countries in which development is coming 
a little later than in the others, many of the issues there are still applicable today. And they're always a source of knowledge. I want to finish by having a special word of thanks to Minister Anstad and the work that we have done with the Norwegian presidency during this year. It has been very stimulating for me, particularly on my year of arrival at this position. There was certainly a good environment that you helped create it for me. And of course, to Minister Ramzawa, who's always been a great supporter of my work in general and in the preparation of the summit. So we look forward to lively debates and discussions and a lot of learning from each other to come in the two years ahead. Thank you all again for coming here. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. We are this year privileged to have to deliver our keynote speech, one of the leading thinkers of our times in respect of economics and particularly socioeconomics, and that is Professor Amatya Sen from Harvard University. His work has been very wide ranging on growth and development, but especially known for his work on welfare economics and uh, the theory of social choice, for which opus he was awarded in 1998 with the Nobel Prize for Economic Sciences. His theme this afternoon uh, for us will focus on the relevance of transport and its funding. And it's my pleasure now to call on Professor Sen to deliver his keynote. Well, first of all, I'd like to say how deeply honored I feel to have the opportunity of speaking here on an extraordinarily important conference. And it's, uh, uh, I can't adequately thank the organizers for giving me this chance. If the world is in many ways much richer today than anything that our ancestors could have imagined, the credit for that achievement goes largely, as Adam Smith argued more than 200 years ago, to the use of economies of scale and skill formation made possible by increasing trade and exchange taking place over the centuries. In the context of this conference on the funding of transport, it's particularly important to bear in mind the central fact that the gains from division of labor, which is one of the main sources of prosperity for so many people in the world today, and could help to raise the living standards of others as well, are thoroughly dependent on the availability of usable transport. In presenting this central thesis, Adam Smith not only referred to contemporary trade in his time, but discussed how dependent the ancient civilizations across the world were on the use of navigable rivers for early commerce. And he gave examples based on the exchange of commodities through the legendary rivers of ancient Egypt, ancient China, ancient India, and elsewhere. In my short presentation, I will confine my discussion to four particular issues. The first with which I've already begun is the need to take, the, take note of the foundational importance of transportation in the generation and sharing of economic prosperity in the world. The second question relates to the special role that transport and its funding can have in the present situation of widely shared recession across the world and the part that transport investment may or may not be able to play in providing stimulus and in fact facilitating economic growth in a time of austerity. The third is the need for the need to integrate environmental considerations into the thinking about the future directions of transport and about its promotion as well as regulation and restraint, paying adequate attention to the integrity of the global 
as well as local environment. And the fourth is the role of well-reasoned public policy regarding transport in addressing environmental problems as well as other problems of social and economic living together that the transport sector faces. The short time that I have for this presentation, and this is quite a crowded conference, will not allow me to enlarge on this agenda, though there are other issues, and I fear I have to be exceptionally brief even on these four subjects. One of the omissions I'd like to flag right now, without having the time to discuss it further, is the role of good transport in getting people together across the boundaries of nations and regions. Increased contact and communication have been one of the major forces helping the progress of civilization in a way that David Hume saw with remarkable clarity in the, in the 18th century, already in fact in early 18th century. I have to apologize for not being able to discuss this important question further, but I will try permit myself my remark, uh, permit myself to make a passing remark that if they attempt to impose a unified currency and the accompanying hardship and austerity over the Eurozone has generated disaffection among people of different European countries, as seems obvious from public opinion surveys, the availability of easier and cheaper transport, perhaps with innovative arrangements, such as perhaps Europass at very discount prices, could have precisely the opposite effect even though I won't have the opportunity of discussing it much here. One of the much noted observations on spending on transport infrastructure in the world over the last two or three decades is that the percentage of gross domestic product GDP devoted to this field has been stationary, perhaps even falling a little, in the developed countries, whereas the percentage of GDP used for this purpose has grown fast, very fast, and more than one and a half times in what are called emerging economies. There is, of course, no mystery here, partly because developed economies already have a much more extensive transport infrastructure, but also because the expansion of the opportunity of available transport is part and parcel of the process of economic growth, which have been much larger in the emerging economies than in the developed ones. While there is little point in elaborating on these obvious connections, I think a couple of additional concerns may be linked with them. One of them is that if the developed economies of Europe and North America at last start growing faster, as I believe they have to, if they want to escape the malaise in which they are caught, currently caught, and as seems to be at last agreed, with, if, even if with some reluctance, in powerful circles in Europe, then the entire trend in infra transport infrastructure could to be, has to be revised upwards, rather than being based just on the extrapolation of the past. And since infrastructure development takes time, the process cannot be easily speeded up. The need for enlightenment, enlightened thinking on this subject may well be already overdue. The second point related to the first, that is the importance of transport for economic prosperity, is that many of the poorer economies are not yet at all in the category of being emerging economies. And the process of rectification of persistent poverty in many parts of Africa, Asia, and Latin America calls for systematic and forward-looking transport planning with specific room for expansion. Indeed, the reach of newly arriving prosperity, even in the so-called emerging economies which are growing fast, is often rather limited. And the expansion of facilitating transport infrastructure can be a very important part of poverty alleviation and equitable sharing, even in countries that are already having reasonably fast overall rates of average economic progress. Just as the availability of microcredit and economic organization for the poor can in many circumstances be an, an, an engine of poverty removal and of more equitable economic progress, so can the extension of facilities of transport to people left behind. 
in the economic race. I turn now to the second issue, the relevance of transport expansion in a world with recession and austerity. The development of infrastructure of transport is of course extensive, and the tempt temptation to economize on spending on transport infrastructure can be quite strong in an economy under strain, which is trying to cut public spending and where the transport sector does not appear to be under any strong immediate pressure. In response to that, there is of course the point which I've already made that the infrastructure may come under pressure once Europe and America achieve more economic growth, and we have to think about it now. But over and above these rather straightforward points, there's also the more difficult, and I share inescapably more controversial issue of the role of transport spending and investment in actually helping to stimulate economic expansion and growth. In talking about this subject, especially in an OECD forum, I'm very aware that I am at some disadvantage. I've been arguing about the, what I think is economic mistake involved in a policy of indiscriminate austerity ever since that policy was introduced as an alleged cure for excessive public deficit and debt in European countries. My friend, Uncle Goria, the Secretary General of the OECD, may remember that he kindly presided over my address at the annual meeting of the World Bank, jointly held with OECD in Paris two years ago in May 2011, where the title of my talk was on growth-mediated development. I also wrote on this in the Le Monde, La Repubblica, The Guardian, The New York Times, with no impact whatsoever, if I'm any judge. <laughs> it can be perhaps argued that, uh, that justifiably no impact, but that's not the view that I'm going to take. At the decision-making pass in Europe, a different reading of what was needed, and they were not going to budge, despite the critic of a critique of many economists, I was not the only one. The actual experience since then, I believe, of the anticipated achievement of austerity in cutting down the burden of deficit and debt has been, in my judgment at least, altogether dismal. In contrast with the ratio of deficit to GDP, in contrast, the ratio of deficit to GDP has just fallen in the USA thanks to economic growth because the, the denominator has been growing, not, not just an attempt to cut the, the, the numerator. And that, of course, has been the standard way of cutting the ratio of deficits in the past. For example, if you recollect what happens at the end of the Second World War, well, what happened to these accumulated war debts? Or during the Clinton presidency, where uh, Bill Clinton began with a high ratio of deficit and ended with none in a period of high growth. And the growth-oriented approach has acquired new con converts recently, for example in Japan, with some immediate success, but not, at least not yet, in Europe. It's important to ask what could have been the reason, and that for an economist is, in my judgment, the right question, for which the economic de debate seemed to be, at least uh, according to some of us, so badly mixed up when the curative value of austerity were being championed. Because it's a, it's a question of saying, why could people think in this line? How could they think in this line? There is, of course, the immediate issue of how to deal with the bond markets and so on, and whether the government can do something to, 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 to generate confidence. But there is also a question of economic causation. I think one has to accept that, they, that Europe has needed serious institutional reform quite badly for some time. But the strong case for institutional reform has to be distinguished from an imagined case of this indiscriminate austerity. Through the bundling of the two together, of reform and austerity, as a kind of chemical compound, it became very difficult to advocate reform which Europe definitely needed, without cutting public expenditure all around. And this did not serve the cause of reform at all well. As I gave in an interview and to Correa de la Serra two days ago, 
that is like you ask for an aspirin and your doctor gives it mixed with rat poison. So you either have the aspirin with the rat poison or you don't have the aspirin at all. And I think it does make, through the, um, the um, uh, one uh, casualty of that mixing up, in my judgment, was reform itself. Because we could have had a lot more reform if it had not been tied up with the austerity and they could make a big difference to many European countries. Especially since people, and Europe is democratic, especially the voters, their opposition to austerity is strengthened their resistance to institutional reform as well. And this unfortunate effect has been in addition to the terrible impact of austerity on the lives of people through undue hardship and through massive unemployment. One additional counterproductive effect of the policy of austerity has been the loss of productive power. And over time, the loss of skill as well, resulting from continued unemployment of the young, like 50 to 60 percent of young Greeks not having any job. The very process of skill formation on which Adam Smith put emphasis for the progress of human society and economic development and in which context transport and trade um, received his uh, Smith's special blessing was quite badly, in my judgment, manhandled to tying together the uncalled for austerity with totally necessary reform. Many countries in the world still need much more institutional reform. There has been some reform in Europe, but much more needs to be done. But they do not need, in my judgment, any more austerity, in fact, the opposite. In thinking about spending and investment in transport infrastructure, it is very important, I would argue, to see clearly that an expansion in this field in transport um, does not make reform any more difficult, while helping to stimulate the economy in a powerful way if the process is well chosen. That is the context, I would argue, in which the challenges of transport spending and funding have to be viewed today, especially in Europe. I turn now to the last two issues. What about the environment? One of the strong arguments against further expansion of transport is the belief that it would be environmentally terrible to go that way. That link, that line of thinking uh, which has uh, some basis to it, is partly reflected, if only implicitly, even in the fact that the established tax rates on emission, for example on CO2, is very much higher in fuel used for transport than for all other purposes, including heating and lighting. There are obviously many considerations here, and the question is complex and I shouldn't try to oversimplify it, but if transport is indeed central to economic progress and to reaching the neglected parts of the population that do not benefit enough from aggregate rates of growth, just as microcredit is, then we have to see well-chosen expansion of tra transport as being quite central to enhancing the quality of life of people, especially of the neglected parts of the population. It's important to be clear that in talking about transport, we are not talking just about luxuries such as the Orient Express, but about necessary transactions of commerce, of economic cooperation, of tourism, to which many people find a job, earn an income, and advance their well-being and freedom, and ultimately also their productive skill. We must recognize the central point, but we must also go beyond that into the demands of public policy. There are, in fact, two major concerns to be addressed here. The first relates to the fact that the development of renewable energy can itself be a part of the environmental challenge, and in that context, the need for much more research on storage, transmission, and I would add portability of energy for transport calls for special effort right now. There are many different kinds of challenges here, including for example, guaranteeing the continuous availability of power generated by solar and wind energy 
which are produced on a discontinuous basis. This takes us to scientific and engineering research on cutting down, cutting down the cost of storage and transmission. Some of the research is already partly on the way, but much more needs to be done. There's also a case for a more radical research, very radical indeed at this time, that would be needed to find some form of non-fossil fuel that can be used for aviation. The recent experience of overheating of batteries in Boeing 787, the Dreamliners, is not encouraging here. But the dependence on fossil fuel has to be addressed at many different levels of sophistication and radicalness in research. In short, distinct types of research in science and engineering are needed to address the problems of energy use in transportation, which can be extremely important for transport and for trade and for their role in helping economic progress as well as in removing human deprivation. Another concern that is very relevant in the context of the environmental impact of transport arises from the well-established fact that many forms of transport are far less energy using in aggregate than others are. The development of public transport, for example, through expansion of rails can cut down on more energy guzzling ways of moving people and goods to private cars and motorized vehicles. And the tax and incentive policies often don't reflect it, even in my own country in India. Um, the uh, the uh, road transport pays less for diesel fuel than rail does. It says the opposite, it's a reverse subsidy. All these needs a great deal of public discussion, as well as careful decision making on public policy. <coughs> While these and related public policy issues are important for the environment and for sustainable development, I would like to end by noticing, noting that they have other uses as well. For example, in generating a society with good civic facilities and interactive social living and contact across the across border, a point that I mentioned earlier, David Hume made with compelling clarity more than 200 years ago. But I fear I must stop now since my time is up. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, uh, Professor Sen. In a little conversation earlier, I thought it would be a great pity to have Professor Sen with us here and have no opportunity to make a comment or pose a question. So we have a little opportunity, and I thank the Professor for staying here on the podium. I'm going to take three questions or comments. The Professor has remarked modestly that after much speaking and writing about austerity, that he's had little impact. Be that as it may, he doesn't lack in clarity, and he has given us a very provocative uh, introduction today, uh, not least his combination of aspirin with rat poison uh, um, among uh, the, the, the menu uh, that he countenanced. So who would like to, to, to pose a question to Professor Sen? Please indicate by raising your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Please, on, on my right-hand side, over here. If they could announce who they are. Yes, they? please, if you can say who you are yeah. and who you represent. Thank Hello, you. Mr. Sen. I'm uh, Dirk Lontner, a social scientist, and here is a journalist. Um, my question is, transport, more transport, that means acceleration of economics, and there is a contradiction to the environmental disaster the globe is facing. What do you say? More transportation, more growth of economics, and on the other side, um, environmental crisis all around. Thank you. Another question or comment? I don't, I don't see any hands up. Professor, I'm going to, uh, to uh, if I may then, uh, abuse the privileges of, 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 of moderation. The, the environment economic trade-off is, is a big issue, and indeed you've, you've touched on it in some degree in, in what you had to say. Um, 
On Europe's austerity, you've talked about escaping the malaise by trending up on investment. Taking global trends for developed economies and the level of investment in developed economies, is this something which you would generalize or is it a specifically European recommendation that you make? Okay. <laughs> Shall I respond to them now? Please. Thank okay. you. All right. Um, I think beginning with the second question, I think it's, um, um, uh, it's not that it's only confined to Europe, uh, my friend, but uh, it's applied particularly to Europe because Europe has a growth problem in a way that China doesn't. And even though it com people complain about India's growth rate coming down, coming down growth rate in India is 6%. I was called one morning uh, by two television, one from a French television saying, this was about a year and a half ago, that um, great news from Europe that there have been no contraction in Eurozone income per head, uh, zero growth rate. Is this a moment of congratulation? And I got a call from NDTV in New Delhi saying terrible rate, terrible growth numbers have come in. And I said, how terrible is terrible? And they said 6% growth rate a year. Now, I think uh, what this brings out is that the need is not exactly the same in different parts. But would if India was in the same malaise, or China was, which it's not, and of course, more to the point, Japan was, was, it, was there a case to, for rethinking, indeed, as um, I would argue, um, uh, Abe and, 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 the, and, the, and Kuroda, as the, as the uh, head of the bank of Japan, who used to be the head of the Asian Development Bank, so I do know him in that context, have been thinking, uh, that would be an important thing. So, yes, mm -hmm. and I think in America it could be an important issue too, and as you probably know that this is one of the subjects on which there is a debate even between the two political parties in America. On the first question, I can see the sense of desperation of transport, more transport, and the real difficulty is that, I mean, this is the same kind of problem that applies to freedom, where people had said, my God, more and more freedom is terrible. Usually it's the complaint, I'm not accusing you of that, it comes from people who actually have quite a bit of freedom themselves, but in fact the expansion of everybody's freedom seems a little jarring with the harmonious world. But I think if freedom is important, and including freedom to transport, move around, after all, we are dealing with people trying to visit others, and there are times when these are very important things. And I know that particularly in India because there used to be a time when almost everything, you need government permission to do anything. I remember sitting in the Reserve Bank of India when there was a lady who was trying to get a foreign exchange to go to Canada. And the person who was on the other side of the table told me, so um, when did you see your sister last? And she said, oh, you saw her uh, last year already. Well, the government of India does believe in sisters seeing sisters, but once in two years might be all right. Now, I think we, when you come to a situation where we really want to not have the, allow people the means to see each other, to conduct trade, to move commodities, to learn, go to universities abroad, and, uh, and do all other things for which uh, I've already mentioned their names, I can mention many others, David Hume, Adam Smith, uh, Marky de Condorcet, many others are good in very powerful voice. I think there is something wrong there, but I think the right way of thinking about it is the thing that uh, Gru Brundtland made us all understand, namely not to think about the growth being an evil, but we need sustainable development. She focused on need fulfillment. I would go further that it's our comprehensive freedom to lead the kind of life that we have reason to value, which we want to sustain. And that requires a judicious expansion of transport. It's not any kind of unthinking transport. And indeed, my fourth point was that we need public, public reasoning on what kind of transport. But just as you may be concerned that transport, more transport may be a dangerous world, I'm a little worried that restricting transport may be a dangerous world too in terms of the, the, what we must value most.
namely the freedom of human beings to lead the kind of life they have reason to value. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Go back now. Yes. <laughs> As other assistants have I assist the professor as someone with experience already of falling down the steps today. <laughs> and I have a metal knee <laughs> for that. <laughs> so, thank you so much, Professor Sen. It's my pleasure now to invite to address us Mr. John Micklewaite. John is editor-in-chief of The Economist, and we live in an age when print media seems to be under enormous stress from from uh, new media, uh, and of course most media are multiple. Uh, but The Economist can boast in his period as editor-in-chief a growth in sales. It sells one and a half million copies uh, regularly in 200 countries. And in 2010, in the way that our sportsmen pick the footballer of the year among footballers, or the golfer of the year among golfers, the British Society of Magazine Editors in 2010 Pick John as the editor's editor, and he will now speak to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, to be chosen an editor's editor by journalists is always rather a worrying idea. Um, I'd also like to thank Amartya. We sit together on the British Museum board, and what comes through there is Amartya's capacity to come through history in many different ways. I'm going to be much shorter and focus on what might be described as a single dumb question, which is what I went away to look at. And the basic question was, why aren't governments investing more in transport infrastructure and infrastructure in general at the moment? And I think that breaks down into two ideas. The first is a concept which I suspect everybody in this room is self-evidently true, is that governments should invest more but I'm not so sure that everybody else shares it. And the second is that if that is correct, that governments have not been investing as much in transport as they should have done, or in infrastructure as they should have done, why? Is that because politicians, with the obvious exception of all the 50 ministers gathered here, have somehow become more boneheaded and stupid? Is it because of individual reasons, or has there been a fundamental balance in I, what I would call the political economy around such decisions. And I suspect there may be a little of the second. So let's look at that first question. Are we generally underspending on transport or infrastructure at a time when we would think we should be spending more? And I think people outside this room, again, would question that. If I was a citizen of Leipzig, I would look around and I would see the rather splendid German infrastructure I would note that this is a time of austerity, that there are hard decisions to be made, and I might decide that actually spending more money on different versions of infrastructure was not necessarily needed. You could add in all the environmental concerns, which Amartya also mentioned. But I think overall, if you look at the West in particular, I think you can make the case really rather strongly that we have invested less in this particular recession, this time of need, in those sort of projects than we would normally have expected to do. And as an example, as a way of illustrating that, I'm going to look at the Amer United States. America is special in some ways, but it is more diverse and more big than other countries, and so I think it's a good one to start with. And I think there are four reasons, if you look at America, why you would expect them to be investing more. The first, and I apologize to the Americans here, is straightforward. Their infrastructure is lousy. Um, most of it was built 50 or 60 years ago, some from the beginning of the century. It's, it's amazing, it's only five years since that bridge collapsed in Minnesota, claiming 13 lives. And still, despite that, you still find that in America there are 70,000 bridges, roughly 11% of the total, which are still rated as structurally deficient. And it costs money. Americans spend 67 billion on the damage to their cars every year from bad roads. They spend 78 billion in terms of waiting um, in terms of wasted time and petrol, crashes add $230 billion. All those numbers, I should admit, frankly, are from the American Society of Civil Engineers who have a very small vested interest in building more roads 
but pretty much every economist who's looked at it comes back with roughly the same numbers, that America is not spending enough on infrastructure. In rough terms, the Center for American Progress, the think tank last year, came up with the number that America was spending roughly half the $262 billion it needs to spend a year updating its infrastructure. So on the one hand, yes, that's the first reason to invest more. Second, and Mautier again pointed towards this, if you are somebody who believes in taking aspirins rather than rat poison, you would expect the government to be putting money in at the moment, and you would expect them to be putting money into infrastructure, because on the whole, that is the best way to create growth and jobs out of the various cocktail of things that people can do. When people examined the Obama stimulus, they came back with the number that money spent on infrastructure had a multiplier of 1 to, one to 2.5, meaning that for every dollar you spent, you created that much more um, in, 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 in economic activity. That's around 30% more productive than cutting taxes. The third bit, which goes right the way back to the round table I was at earlier this morning, is it is fundamentally cheap at this precise moment for governments to go out and invest in infrastructure. As long as you think of it as being long term, the American government can borrow at a few percentage points at this precise moment. It can borrow long term and it can borrow cheaply. It's also a time when there's a vast amount of cash rich governments um, in the Asia who understand about infrastructure and also, as we heard earlier, a vast amount of pension funds and insurers looking for longer term um, uh, assets to meet their liabilities. Finally, I would argue very quickly in the case of America, it's a basic issue of national greatness, if you want, just at a time when America is being challenged by places like China. The fact that it can't build this stuff, I think, matters. Is this a country that can still get big things done, the head of the US Chamber of Commerce asked at the beginning of this year. Okay, there are some caveats to that. I think within the states, quite a lot of things are going on. I'm intrigued by California, the state I know best, has suddenly begun to reinvest in infrastructure. I'm intrigued by Mitch Daniels, the man who perhaps the Republicans should, if only he had done it, have chosen to run last year, that he was somebody who pushed this particularly in Indiana. But overall, I don't think there's much doubt that America has not been spending enough and has spent very little in this particular recovery compared with previous areas like the recession. And America, I think, is not that alone. Yes, it's got slightly worse infrastructure, but it is not, it's in its failure to move towards infrastructure as part of the answer, it's not alone. It's incredible to me that the, in Britain, the Tories came in and amongst the first things they slashed was infrastructure rather than anything else. If you look at the EU's great budget, which is gonna push the European economy forward, there was a large amount of fuss, perhaps made by some people in this room, that there'll be a massive increase in infrastructure investment. So it was going to be increased threefold to 50 billion euros, which sounds great until you realize they were spending 290 on cohesion and 283 billion for direct agricultural subsidies. In this particular change, in this particular recession, we have not pumped money into infrastructure as previous people did in previous times. And so it sits there, and that brings me to my second question. Why? Why hasn't it worked? this particular time? And I think the answer is that there's a lot of, at one level, there's a lot of individual reasons. If you take my American roads example, you, there you have the problem of the highway fund. It was created by Congress. It has a mandated um, tax of 18.4 cents per gallon on gas, which is helped to, supposed to help push in Congress's share. That amount has not raised since 1993, it has not been pegged to inflation. Every year, there is a battle about it. This year, next year, the C Congressional Budget Office expects the Highway 1 to f run dry. It's an individual problem. You could argue the same. We have Howard Davis here about Heathrow. Various British governments have come up with various sort of non-answers to Heathrow so far. It's a succession of individual mistakes, perhaps. But I think if you look slightly deeper, I think you can see structural reasons why these things aren't working. I would argue, firstly, that infrastructure, despite everything I've said earlier, has got a sort of image problem. Um, yes, people like the idea of spending, and I'll come back to that in a second, but infrastructure is a particularly visible way to get things wrong. The Economist was set up to analyze the railway boom of the 1840s, or in partly set up for that. I'm also a man who invested in Eurotunnel, 
you don't need to be reminded of things can go bad. You look at America, whenever you mention infrastructure, people began to talk about bridges to nowhere. If you mentioned in Spain, they begin to talk about the white elephant um, airports at Castellon and Ciudad Real. Voters like the idea of having something big and new, but they are suspicious, I think, about the details. Secondly, I think there is straightforwardly an accounting problem. Infrastructure is far too often chucked in with current spending. Those Tories, those Conservatives, who thought Britain should be spending more money on infrastructure were scared off it because they were worried about them going into the general numbers. We talked about this morning with the ministers. There is this strange thing where nobody accounts for governments in the same way as you account for companies. None of us would go out and borrow money for a mortgage and expect that to be lumped in with our dry cleaning bill, but that is the way in which many, Ameri many governments still work. Thirdly, I think the public-private partnerships so far have not taken off self-evidently in the numbers that you see around here. I'm staggered, again, looking at the numbers in America, how low they are. When you look at the numbers in the briefing you've all got, those include the comparatively virtuous Canadians. Very, very little money has managed to come through that particular avenue so far outside a few questions. In the end, though, I think it comes down to two things. The first is politicians. It strikes me that politicians are pretty much the same as always. When they look at infrastructure, projects and you can go back and you can read about people trying to make the same decisions in 1930s America or for that matter in 1950s California. Politicians have always wanted three sort of totally contradictory things about infrastructure. They wanted it to be shovel ready, ready to go. They wanted it to be as grand as possible and they wanted it to be as cheap as possible. Those three things are wholly contradictory. They want shovel ready because they want it to be there not only to boost money into the economy, but so they can get pictured in front of a whirring bulldozer, or for that matter, a bulging pipe. It's no fun setting up a great big infrastructure project only to wait for your successor to stand beside it. Secondly, they want big projects. If you look at Britain, there's a plan to um, it, it link the south with the north by a new form of train called High Speed 2. Most of the economic evidence, there may be people here who disagree with me, say that actually you could achieve the same by just lengthening some platforms and straightening the track. But if I was David Cameron, I wouldn't really want to go down in history as the man who lengthened a platform. By contrast, his rival Boris Johnson has come up with a somewhat imaginary version of an airport and reaped enormous gains from the idea of Boris Island. Politicians like big projects. And finally, they want them to be cheap. But again, none of these things have changed. None of them are fundamentally different when you look back to previous eras. Politicians have always had that. So what has changed? The closest I can get to looking at it is to do with the lobbying, to do with the public opinion around these particular issues. And here I would go back to actually an economist called Manka Olson, who wrote The Logic of Collective Action in 1965. And Manka Olson looked at the idea of vested interests, of public interests, and he advanced the idea that interest groups on the whole would become ever more particular and ever more directed. The reason being that if you set up an interest group, if it's a broad one, you end up with a lot of free riders who are sort of in roughly the same position of you when you actually need lots of money, lots of energy, and lots of time directed at things. If you want, if you end up with a business roundtable, then that's sort of pretty good for most people. If, by contrast, you end up with something like the National Cotton Council, a deeply virtuous organization which has existed since the 1930s to extort $2 billion out of the American government for cotton growers. If you are a cotton grower, one of those is directly useful to your business every single year. The business council is less. Why does that matter to transport? I think if you look, and I use the example of California, if you look at the time when California really built all the freeways, all the universities, all the things it now uses, that was back in the 1950s and 1960s when there was a broad business elite which very firmly supported the idea of growth as a whole. You had a group of people who were united behind that. They might have been rather white, they might have been rather waspish, they might have not been that keen on higher taxes, but in general, they liked the idea of California going in one direction. Since then, Californian lobbying, and I would argue this is true of everywhere around the world, has got ever more particular. The Chamber of Commerce has given away to an industry association, the Semiconductor Association. And then from the Semiconductor Association, you go down to individual companies. Individual companies tend to lobby on much narrower things, and you can see that again and again. You can see that in the fuss about Heathrow, where you have 
basically a big business need for a general airport, but you have a lot of particulars who aren't prepared to push it. And yet on the other side of it, all the dynamics of public interest have gone the other way. If you want to oppose something up front, there are now ever more ways and possibilities to stop it. I was amazed on the aforementioned um, High Speed 2, the number of um, women who I once met, um, I think at drinks parties back in the 1970s, who managed to get hold of my email to tell me about exciting new economic studies explaining why railway lines shouldn't be bought, built through their garden at the bottom. There are so many more means now for people who object to big infrastructure projects to go the other way. My conclusion then is that infrastructure, whether we like it or not, has become a bit like free trade. It's become one of those things where there is a general good from which we can all win, but the particular costs, the upfront costs at the beginning, are much harder. And so that spills me into various questions about what you can do to try and mitigate against that. Do you need hypothecated taxes? Should transport end up as being more like a regulated utility? Do you need to have more regulated assets, transport funds? These are questions which I think, in essence, spring from my single dumb question at the beginning, but they're ones which I think have changed fundamentally because of that changing balance of power. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, we're going to set up here for our uh, panel. I'm going to invite you, John, to take a place, if you will, in the panel. And also to invite to join us here on the platform Angel Gurria, the Secretary General of OECD, uh, Howard uh, Davies, Chair of the UK Government Airport Policy Review, and to invite our host ministers uh, today, Minister Arnstad and Minister Ramsar, also to join us on the platform. So we've had a very diverse uh, and uh, fascinating introduction and we just have a short few minutes uh, for our uh, panel so let me get straight into it. Uh, Angel Gurria, who's Secretary General of OECD, uh, started in that post in June 2006, is now in his second mandate since uh, uh, September in 2010. Uh, Mexican national, former Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister of Finance. In the context of our discussions today, Secretary General, transport, funding, austerity. I hand it over to you to locate an OECD view for us, please. Thank you. I, I, um, I like the uh, little question mark that you added to the title of the panel because what normally should be stating the obvious, you know, to investing uh, for growth. Uh, today, five years into the crisis, is more a question mark than a statement. In fact, it's become a problem. Uh, a, few, a few issues... Um, to trigger discussion. First of all, many of our governments are still operating under extremely tight budgetary margins. The general government deficit in the OECD reached 5.5% of GDP. That's a deficit on average in 2012. The general government debt to GDP ratio is projected to reach 111% in 2013. Of course, the gold medal goes to Japan there, they're at 220 percent, but that's, uh, we don't want to be in that podium, I suppose. This means that many governments have run out of firepower on the fiscal side to stimulate the economy. And of course, we run out of most of the firepower on the monetary policy side because we are at very low interest rates already and we've used a lot of the QE uh, room that we could have used. And my second point regards the private sector's diminished investment drive. So you have a relatively poor uh, public sector and a, a private sector which is um, incurring in an obvious contradiction. Rates are as low as they've ever been in courtesy of the central bank, not only short-term rates, but even long-term rates with a twist and all these monetary policy operations. They're going into very, very low, as low as they've ever been and they've announced that, that they will continue to be low for the next three or four years, and the private sector is not coming through. They're not joining. Uh, even uh, when uh, governments uh, 
uh, bring them in, try to lure them in through some um, guarantees or uh, taking the first losses or whatever. It's actually not happening. Now, for the, uh, for the OECD, you say, well, what, what should we do? What can we do? I think uh, the solution is really to just to go through and continue with the implementation of reforms. We've been recommending uh, to focus reforms on four areas. Go structural, and that means uh, medium long term, uh, education, innovation, uh, competition, the tax uh, structure, the health uh, uh, situation, the R&D, et cetera. Uh, the flexibility in the labor markets, the flexibility in the product markets. Go social because there's still many, many millions of victims of the, um, of the crisis. Go green, uh, and that has to do with transport, absolutely no doubt, uh, because we are fulfilling here an intergenerational uh, obligation, and that is to look at green growth as a, a way to uh, do the growth going forward, as the only way to do the growth going forward, including investments in uh, infrastructure. And of course, to go institutional. Um, we really have to get the institutions uh, uh, to adapt to what is uh, clearly a new reality. Uh, priorities in investment to get it right, skills, innovation, infrastructure, um, very, very short reference to skills. We seem to be, with this paradox, millions unemployed and companies saying they can't find the right talent. We obviously got wrong on the skills side, we got to make that match. On the innovation side, of course, moving into knowledge-based capital seems to be uh, the way uh, to go. I'd like to say that um, uh, all the uh, knowledge-based services here uh, look like some of the most promising growth areas. And of course, last but not least, infrastructure, and here including uh, transport infrastructure. Our countries need to rebuild their transport networks. Uh, John Micklethwaite was just mentioning some of the cases uh, in the United States, which is uh, one of the most obvious and uh, very often uh, referred to, uh, but uh, practically everybody is either in the emerging economies because they have to accompany growth with the infrastructure and the more mature economies because they've had the infrastructure now for many, many decades. Uh, our countries need to rebuild the transport networks to transit to a new area of more intelligent, environmentally friendly transport technology. Investments in clean transport infrastructure can actually generate a variety of network effects. Now, take the case of ports. We just had a, a short uh, uh, side event on ports. Port attractive industries can represent a relatively large share of employment and value added in port regions. For example, in the main port regions in Northwest Europe, they represent up to 10% of employment and 16% of the value added. We had the mayor of Hamburg the mayor of Long Beach, the mayor of Venice. Reforms that stimulate investment in clean transport infrastructure can have a double dividend, promoting inclusiveness and promoting green growth. So let me conclude with one suggestion. Our reforms, just as our decisions to cut spending or keep growing our debts or the option thereof, as Amartya has just suggested, that we seem to have gone for the wrong conclusion, according to him, um, have to be focused on one priority, and that is the people. This year's uh, Ministerial Council meeting in, in Paris next week is going to be called It's All About the People. Um, so I'm talking about the nearly 62% of the world population that lives on less than $5 a day, the more than 200 million unemployed worldwide, the nearly 75 million youngsters out of a job, the most poor, uh, the more vulnerable. So let's not forget that growth is not an end of itself, uh, but a means to improve the lives of all these people. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask in a supplementary for one very brief answer, it's just capturing the flavor of what we had earlier. You refer to extremely tight government margins. You refer to private sector diminished investment drive. And your, your formula is the reform formula go, go uh, structural, go social, go green. Is your aspirin entirely a reform aspirin? <laughs> uh, where just does, it differ, where does it differ from the other guys then? And the reason is if you run out of uh, uh, ubuprofen and you run out of uh, 
acetaminophen or whatever it is, you got that. You got structural change. And strangely enough, what you have now is that uh, the best short-term policies, and maybe in many cases the only one, seems to be what we always considered long-term policies. And that is why we don't want to go into, like transportation, we don't want to go into infrastructure, we don't want to go into health, and we don't want to go into education or innovation, because they don't yield results tomorrow. But first of all, they're the only thing we've got now. And second, they are going to be the ones that underpin the recovery, if we get the recovery going, as we believe we'll get even for Europe towards the end of this year into 2014, these structural policies are the ones that are going to create, among other things, the confidence. We have a crisis of growth, we have a, a crisis of employment, we have a crisis of uh, inequality, but we also have a crisis of trust, of confidence in all the institutions we built over the years. And uh, we believe that going structural is a way in which we will be able to rescue uh, the growth, uh, rescue or improve the unemployment, the inequality uh, figures, and also uh, get back on, at least on the way to rescuing the trust. Thank you. H Howard, Howard Davis, I, I mentioned, is doing work for UK government on airport policy, but has had many hats over the years in financial services regulation, London School of Economics and Political Science, uh, I think now Professor at Sciences Po in Paris, to, to add to a, a, a stellar list. Could I ask you, it's not confined necessarily to the airports, but a big issue today we've been dealing with is the question of funding and the question of private partnerships. And it seems to me that UK airports are probably somewhere out on the edge of the envelope to do with the private part, and I would be very interested to hear your take on that and the wider questions we've been discussing. Well, thank you, Pat. Um, professional actors are often advised never to appear on stage with children or cute dogs. Um, speakers should be advised never to speak after Angel Juria because it's always difficult to rival his warmth and enthusiasm. Uh, but I want to begin by thanking uh, the OECD and the ITF through Angel for the work they do in this area, bringing people together. They brought together a terrific seminar earlier this year in Paris on airports, uh, looking, bringing together people who were thinking about how to make these decisions around the world. Uh, I can't say I found an answer, but it was cheering to find that there were other people as perplexed as we are in the UK. And there is some kind of solace in shared misfortune. Now, I'm somewhat reluctant from the UK perspective to lecture people on infrastructure and particularly investment in it because the World Economic Forum rankings on transport infrastructure put us in 24th place, uh, which in footballing terms is outside the Premier League, uh, outside the Bundesliga. Um, by the way, in passing, I will be astonished if anyone is at dinner, certainly if any German is at dinner this evening, rather than watching the Champions League final, but that's a problem for the rest <laughs> of you. Uh, but there are in the UK some very big projects underway which uh, do have some interesting aspects, I think, for others to look at. Finally, we are building something called Crossrail, which links East and West London. Um, we are, as John referred to, uh, launching a major high-speed train initiative, uh, which is a, on a massive scale. And maybe we will one day have a new runway or even a new airport, uh, if I can ever make up my mind uh, what we should do. Uh, so I just want to make three points uh, to kick off the debate and try to respond to Pat's question. First of all, a growth commission, so-called, run by the London School of Economics just recently, did look at all the academic literature, which Amartya referred to also, and did conclude that it was rigorously possible to show that much infrastructure investment, as long as it's not in the white elephant category, does have a positive impact on growth. Maybe not as high as some over-enthusiastic studies in the past have shown, and there's a lot of variation also, of course, investment is not linear in character because of the network impacts. Um, and indeed, often the best returns come from smaller projects which unblock a larger network. Uh, so I think it's uh, unfortunate to get locked completely into the debate about the big issues of austerity and public spending because actually there is a lot of infrastructure investment which can unblock things, which is not massive in scale, 
but can be extremely productive. Uh, secondly, that we do need a better way of thinking about future returns because, to use uh, economists' language, projects are often not acting on the efficiency frontier. In other words, they depend for their justification on the facilitation they provide for future growth and connectivity, which you cannot instantly model. So there is a sort of temporal question here. The classic example of this is London's sewers in the Victorian era, where a man called Basil Jett invented sewers on a massive scale, and people did, sometimes in rather colourful language, say to him, how can you imagine that the people of London could ever generate this amount of sewage? Well, actually, it was one of the key bits of infrastructure which facilitated the enormous growth of London in the late 19th century, and without it, um, we would have been in a mess, a rather smelly mess, uh, in fact. Now, the issue really is how then to devise ways of thinking about future investment which factor this problem in without just falling into the trap of making up imaginary numbers about mm. future uh, growth, which obviously will discredit the exercise. My last point is, um, is a rather different one and speaks to Pat's question, specific question he put to me, that although the UK record is not um, outstanding in all respects, we have been successful in attracting significant private sector investment into a range of transport projects. Almost all the airports are privately owned and even those which have public participation have public-private participation and we have attracted investment from sovereign wealth funds and pension funds from all over the civilized world uh, and indeed from Australia. Um, we uh, have also uh, got a new rail project um, which is attracting a billion of new uh, investment in the West Coast mainline. And more recently, the government have launched what I think is potentially quite an interesting initiative of something called the Pension Investment Platform, which is an industry-owned and operated investment vehicle, independent of government, which, which is to facilitate investment in infrastructure by pension funds. The initial... Uh, launch target for this is about £2 billion, pounds, so not massive, um, but where they are linking pension funds, which have typically not been great investors in infrastructure projects in the UK, um, we, through a pooled investment vehicle into um, publicly uh, managed infrastructure projects. And that seems to me to speak to the point that John was really making about time horizons where you've simply got to find a way of bringing people with the right long-term investment horizon into these projects to try to find a way of getting round this awkward question to which he pointed um, of the incentives on politicians to deliver something short-term, mm. um, whereas the, the rational investments may be often long-term. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. So not, not in the premiership but with some good players, it seems to me, is a kind of a very quick uh, footballing summary of that. Can I, can I ask you, Howard, on the LSE Growth Commission study you refer to, if, if people Google LSE, is the Growth Commission up there and this material available? Um, uh, yes, indeed. If you LSE, LSE Growth Commission, um, there's, a, there's a main report, but like a lot of these things, um, it's some of the subsidiary reports are sort of more interesting than the main report, and there's a particular report on... Um, transport infrastructure, well, infrastructure investment, because it also includes uh, actually broadband and energy investment, but they're the three case studies and reviews the academic literature in, I think, quite a helpful and accessible way. Thank you. Minister Ramsar, if I could turn to you on, on one of the themes that has come this afternoon is this question of securing public support for long-term projects. And I know, I know from work that I've, I've, I've done with you, but I know more broadly from your policy position that you have an increasing emphasis on citizen participation as part of the chemistry of consent. Could I ask you to develop that for us, please? This is a very good question. Um, I, in, in, in my experience, not even in my three and a half years' time as a federal minister, but also before, we have two really big uh, limitational factors for public big projects. One is funding and the second is the public acceptance. And in 
uh, I think that uh, in, in Germany, in my experience, I have more problems, more problems in regard to public acceptance than I have with funding it. Uh, I can give you a lot of examples. Uh, the, the, the railway station in Stuttgart, mm. which is nothing else but, in fact, upgrading it mm. and putting it from the top to underground, or uh, some four or five big railway projects, the Brenner, the access to the Brenner Tunnel, for instance, which is one of the most important north-south relations within Europe. And um, I am convinced that the more uh, we, can, uh, we can convince the public, the regional public, not only the regional, but beyond the regional public, the Scott, the, the, those who opposed the, the Stuttgart railway station were not only citizens from Stuttgart, but they, they were organized from all over Germany. So if you gain the public, you uh, save a lot of problems as the total project goes ahead. You, uh, if you take the time, the, the necessary time to convince people you, uh, you, you cannot make pro projects uh, completely free of conflicts, but our target is to, to avoid as many conflicts as possible. Uh, we have produced a what we call a public participation manual, a manual for public participation, which is a kit, a really huge kit of proposals what you can do from the very beginning of projects, from the very, very prenatal stage of a project, where you can explain the necessity uh, of a project. And uh, this uh, is uh, for the use um, uh, on all levels, on the local level, the municipal level, and also, of course, for federal projects. One other question, Minister, on this issue you, you've mentioned, which I think is really really fascinating, the need to, to work in a very focused way on public acceptance. To come back to the funding question, uh, as between state and private, and private and public partnerships, what is the German practice or what is the German view? The German practice has traditionally always been public funding, budgetary funding, uh, but as we meet the, the same problems and the restraints as you see in all, uh, in, in all states, and as we try to uh, pursue a, uh, a, a policy, a budget policy in compliance with the Maastricht criteria and the, 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 uh, the uh, public budgets in Germany have been balanced altogether, mm -hmm. local level land, the 16 land levels and the federal levels. Uh, they have been balanced for some years now, and we achieve, uh, I think we, have, we will have a, a budget federal, uh, a, a balanced federal uh, budget in two years' time. Mm -hmm. uh, we only can achieve that and perform uh, this uh, if we step by step go the way of PPP projects. We do this on, uh, I th it's 12 by now 12 road projects, and uh, uh, Wolfga Wolfgang Tiefensee has started this policy. <laughs> it's a very, very wise policy. Uh, but it's somehow strange to the, you know, to the German traditions. The Germans still think that uh, the, the um, um, uh, once uh, uh, it is a public project, it has to be funded mm -hmm. by public budgets. It's wrong. We have to more and more go this way, and I try to extend it also to railway grids because we see that in many, many countries in the world. And what works in many other countries, why should that not work uh, in Germany in regard to railways? And also, we have also the, the, the private funding on the, on the field of all, uh, uh, of all uh, airports. So starting now and maturing over time is the, the summary, I think, to do with the private That's engagement. it, exactly. Thank you. Minister Ronstad, you, you referred in your opening remarks to the need to diversify funding sources. Uh, 
but also, of course, correctly remarked, everyone has their own culture and preference. Mm. The Norwegian way, what is the preference about funding public and private, mm. and what is the preference about taxpayer or user? Mm. Uh, I'll come back to that. May I first just say that, comment a little bit on, the, on, the, on what's been said here about the need of having a long-term and broad mm -hmm. perspective, because uh, I tend to agree that we politicians might sometimes be very short-sighted and want to build grand at a cheap price, of course. Uh, and I do, I, I'm, I think the Norwegian National Transport Plan has a 10-year scope. Mm. I think that's the minimum. Mm. I think that you should at least have plans and they should be broad as an, on a national level, um, including different types of transport forms and has a, should have at least a scope at 10 years level. And then, of course, the more important or the most important will not be the scope itself, but the ability of politicians to be consistent to that plan that has been adopted by the parliament. Uh, and I think that will be increasingly more important in the years to come, uh, probably in Norway and mm. probably also in other countries. Uh, Norway has, um, I, I think every country has to choose their own way of um, fundings and funding mechanisms and it will be different solutions uh, possible and acceptable in different countries. Uh, in Norway, we have choose not to use PPA, PPA, PPS. Okay. And the reason why is probably, I think, I mean, there are private constructors building and constructing and maintaining roads everywhere in Norway, but they do it with public budget money. And I think that our reluctance towards PPBS is, first of all, a reluctance on, lack, on locking up future budgeting uh, and sort of binding up future budgeting. Uh, and if one has the possibility, rather to try to pay through public budget as you build. I think that has been the discussion in Norway. When it comes to organizing things, I think there is much to learn from PPS. I think that uh, private entrepreneurs has a lot to learn, uh, public managements, about how to job both build, uh, construct, and also maintain uh, uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. On the other side, of course, we have a quite extensive uh, user charge in the way that we have uh, uh, many toll roads. About 30% of infrastructure funding in Norway are based on toll roads, and, they, uh, and that is uh, it's been a demanding road to go, uh, but it has been, uh, in many ways, a successful road for Norway. And I think that the fundamental uh, element to create acceptance for toll roads in Norway has been the fact that you have uh, the parliament or the government do not touch a project based on toll roads uh, unless it has been locally suggested and has a local acceptance, and has a local political will behind it. So you're back into the point Peter Ramsar made about citizen participation yeah. and buy-in. In, in some ways, in way. yes, because yeah. I think that uh, there is no, that to, to, to base some sort of the funding on, on toll roads are, are not a smooth issue. It's not a smooth political issue, neither locally or uh, nationally. Uh, but then of, again, it is quite important that you have a solid political will behind it, both locally and uh, nationally. And I think that has to come from the local level up to the national level instead of the opposite way. You've mentioned a 10-year scope in your planning horizon for, for uh, transport infrastructure. How much of that is the new project, the glitzy project, and how much of it is fixing the thing that isn't working from the past? Well, you have to combine those two. There's, I think in a, in a political debate or, or in a political controversy, you often tend to focus on the new investments, the new projects, the brand projects. But of course, you have to balance the needs for maintaining what the investment that you have already made in infrastructure with new investments. Uh, and in the National Transport Plan for Norway, I think you will see that there are about... Uh, not 50-50, not, not but it is about 40-60. Okay. I see. Thank you. John, I'm going to finish with you with uh, appealing for a short answer because I've just been looking at the watch and I say I'm, I'm, I'm risking to run over time.
But I was fascinated in what you called your structural analysis at the end, to your, your big dumb question to quote yourself. You talked about political short-termism, but you added something which was very interesting about particularism in lobbying and that the big questions kind of fall over the edge, either because politically they're very long-term, so what maternity or paternity do they have over time, or because the lobbyists have now become micro-lobbyists and the big picture who speaks for it. I, it was something, when I started to look at the evidence over the past week, it came through quite strongly, is that you look at the areas where people have done big infrastructure building, and it tends to be kind of moments, you saw in Germany with post-reunification, you can see it at the end of wars, there are sometimes moments when countries suddenly feel that they have to do this stuff. You could argue that Japan, at the moment, has suddenly had a, a wake-up call that China is going past it and it's doing a lot of things. But in general, what seems to be happening, I think Olson was right, is that the pressure on all these sort of areas is getting ever more particular. You can see it in the fuss about Heathrow with mm. airlines asking for particular things with particular lobbyists to do with particular little areas. There is that awful, that awful phrase, the great and the good, um, where mm. people used to gradually bond around something. That led to some terrible disasters, but that has, that has gone, I think. And I suspect that actually one way to bring it back, um, this began as a joke in the round table uh, this morning, is, is to actually start measuring governments in a different way. Um, it's all very easy for, for politicians to sit and say, look, we want to be measured over the long term. But actually some of it is to do with the numbers. You know, the basic fact is at the moment, if you go and spend money on infrastructure, you get treated the same as if you just mm. went and spent it on a tank or, on, or, 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 or different things. And I think arguably, actually, uh, to, I rather ungratefully said this this morning, that throws it back at organizations like the OECD, like the IMF, that when they actually come to look at government spending, when people come to measure government mm. spending, they start sorting out between okay. long and short term. And you could argue that magazines as well. But there is, a, there, there is now such a prejudice, I think, against those, that sort of spending that it needs some kind of imbalance, which I hadn't, I hadn't previously thought about. And interesting, so in fact your policy prescription is get the indicators right and get the national accounting changed accordingly in effect. I think that it, there's always the, the whole issue of, um, um, I think even Howard's done some of this, the whole issue of, of, of government balance sheets is a nightmare, but actually it's begun to reach the level where there is no systemic way to actually work out the way in which governments are actually doing things. I mean, it cannot make sense if somebody cannot invest long term or, or does not mm. get judged differently mm. when you go out and build things over a 10, 15, 20 year old time span as opposed to handing over a welfare check today and those have to be measured in different ways in the same way as they are in companies it strikes me well ministers and gentlemen thank you very much indeed for a, a fascinating panel discussion Thank you for uh, joining us. You have deserved and earned your coffee break and uh, all of our sessions resume again at four o'clock. Thank you.